Hello, this is Ralph Hedges. I'm the director of the Chopin Piano Academy. And I used to live in Hawaii, but with the economy and various other factors, I moved to Oregon. And I have a nice studio here in Oregon, and I teach here. A little bit about my background. Uh, my, both my parents were musicians and I took my beginning piano lessons with my mother and my uh, harmony and counterpoint lessons with my father who was the music professor at Denver University at the Lamont School of Music. When I uh, took all my lessons, not only with my parents, but when I got into to high school and college, all my theory lessons were directed about, well, they were, they were, uh, how should I say this? They were just about theory. You know, the principles concerning how things work, you know. Um, of course, that you've got the rudiments, uh, key signatures, um, scales, all that sort of thing. But we never brought out a piece of music to find out what was in a piece of music. And in the theory manuals, they only gave, you know, a, a measure or something like that, or a chord from a piece of music, but not a complete composition. We were never even required to analyze a complete composition. So as a result, I think, of course, that's common with, you know, education today, music education. But as a result, everything was just simply uh, memorized, then practiced. Yeah, you looked at your notes, and you looked at your key signature, and made sure everything, and your accidentals, and you practiced those notes. But you really had no idea what was there in the music. Therefore, how do you play it? What, what are the principles that you go by? Um, like um, certain chords will have um, minor ninths or, or, you know, there's the color in, in those notes. Uh, a basic C major triad, well, that's nothing real special. But anyway, I've decided to take a composition which is from the uh, Bach Well Tempered Clavier. Bach gave us our music that we know today. Um, it all goes back to Bach, an absolute genius, no question about that. The reason I say that he gave us our music is that the tuning system for keyboard instruments, um, piano, organ, harpsichord, of course, in his day, was based on a mean tone system of tuning, where thirds were true thirds. This is a mathematical kind of a situation here, which I'm not going to go into, but the thirds and the sixths were true. They were right in tune. But the problem was that many of the fourths and fifths were so badly out of tune that they were unusable. So the composers for keyboard instruments didn't exceed much more than a couple of sharps or flats simply because of the tuning system. Bach realized this. So he devised a tuning system, which was the well-tempered tuning system, which means that the force and the fist were slightly tempered, not made out of tune, but tempered. Um, the, um, the fists were slightly narrowed, not flattened. I mean, you know, like C to G, you don't go to C to G flat or anything near it, but it's just slightly, and the, and the force were slightly widened. So they were just a little bit out of tune, so that they did not sound terrible. But what was the effect of this well-tempered tuning system was that the third and sixth were quite a bit out of the perfect tuning mathematically. But it really didn't matter too much because thirds and six out of tune sort of sound like a vibrato. Um, so this actually worked out pretty well. And Bach, I have no idea how he worked it out. 
and there's no information as to how he worked it out. It's just simply that he did. And when he did work it out, he wrote his 48 preludes and fugues in all keys, major and minor. It was the first time this had ever been done in the history of music. So as we say, he was, he gave us our music. Uh, my first degree was, uh, I did my graduating recital as an oboist. I played an oboe concerto by the Italian composer Cimarosa, and I did the um, Paul Hindemith oboe piano sonata for my graduating um, performance, and I was hired by the Honolulu Symphony under George Barotti, and also then I was hired by the Punahou School in Hawaii to teach piano and music theory there. Then I went on to um, college. I was accepted in several colleges, but I decided upon the Manhattan School of Music as being something I wanted to do. And also, um, I did my degree in both piano and music theory and graduated with a master's degree. But again, uh, everything was theory. <laughs> Well, theory and composition. One of the I studied under uh, a very fine teacher there, Ludmila Ulela, uh, recognized as one of the one of the very finest teachers in theory and composition. So I, uh, for my uh, graduating, let's say, or my final exam. I, play, I wrote out a, um, a piano prelude, and uh, her comment was, nothing better written today. <laughs> well, <laughs> that sent some shivers up my back, you know, that she would make such a comment. Of course, I got an A out of her class, and uh, a lot of theory was presented to us, and she wrote a book on, on contemporary harmony, which is an excellent book. But the problem still remained, how do you analyze a complete composition? And that's what I'm now presenting in these videos, is how to do this. So let's start off with some manuscript paper. Let's see if we can maybe make this not quite so. Let's see if I can get this. Ah, that's a bit better, I think. Okay, now, in writing music, it's important, by the way, to write it, rather than having to go to your computer and write all the music there. You can, you can take what you've written and put it into computers, so it's, you know, all, all the manuscript and the notes and sharps and flats and so on are perfect, but you should be able to do it, longhand, so to speak. Okay, now, let's... Take this and turn it over. Now let's talk about how to write some of these symbols in music. Well, first of all, you've got your sharps. Okay, a sharp is written with two long lines, very light, very close together, and then two stubby lines, very short, very far apart, and there's your basic sharp. Not like a tic-tac-toe sign. That's not a sharp. <laughs> okay, so if you have a sharp, let's say, in a space. And by the way, your notes are egg-shaped, 45-degree angle. Your sharp then goes beside it, two longer lines, very light. And then two stubby lines on the line, outlining the note itself. Very nice manuscript, as you can see. If the note is on a line, you draw the note egg-shaped, then your two long lines, very light, very close together, and your stubby lines in the two spaces outlining the line. Okay. Now we go on the flats. That would be, again, a light line and then a very heavy 
body as w like one side of a heart shape. Okay, so if it's, if it's in a space note, well, I can draw, I don't need to draw those light. <laughs> okay, and the, the note, A-shaped, and then the flat, a light line, then the heavy line, so that the top of the flat side and the bottom are within the space on the, uh, this, this, the note. And on a line, a light line, and then a, the note in the space. So it's at the top of the space for the next line and the next line here. So it obvious what flat or, or what these symbols are refer, which note they're referring to. Very important because if you have several notes, you know, lines, cluster notes real close together, you need to know where the accidental is. Now, on your, um, on the um, um, natural sign, a very light line, a stubby line at the very bottom, another stubby line, then a, okay, there's your natural sign. If it's in a space, For the note, the light line down to the line. Now that you make your W lines on the lot, two lines outlining the space, and then your very light line on the bottom there, and then in a on a line note. Okay. Your very light line down to the bottom in the space here, and then the stubby line, and then the very light line outlining the uh, line note. And that's about it for that for that much anyway. Now we'll put this back in here, my clipboard. Okay, first thing off is to and have your pencil and eraser possibly, uh, but do things in the in, with a pencil so you can erase if you make a mistake. Get things set up nicely here. Okay, your bar line. Well, that's not too good, but let's at least extend it. Uh. Okay, there we go. First thing off, draw your brace. Which connects the two staff lines here. Okay. Then the treble clef starts. I'm, I make sort of a dot here and then take it on up. Just in the space. Down to the second line down. Down to the bottom line. Up to the third line. And around that. G line here, so it looks like a G for for one thing, and since it's on the G line, we can call it the G clef, or the treble clef. Treble clef is the normal designation. The uh, bass clef. Okay, draw with a uh, line down to the middle line, up to the top line, down and end in the space, and put two dots on either side of the F line. So it can be called the F clef or the bass clef. Um, many years ago, when before computers and before music writing programs for the computer were in existence, I worked for Warner Brothers in California in music preparation. And uh, I had to take a course in music preparation, so that's where my writing of all of these things comes from um, because I worked with the composers for the music for the movies one composer in particular Mark Bucci um, a genius <laughs> marvelous composer did work for Warner Brothers and I was hired to do the music preparation for one of the movies I think it was called Beyond the Gate if I'm not mistaken 
But my word, we were, everything was deadlines. Things had to be done at exact times. And sometimes that would mean working for 36 or 48 hours straight. It was grueling, but my word, I was paid well. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so anyway, that's sort of my background there. And um, so I took, you know, we did this on a daily basis, by the way, between Mark and myself. He he wrote the music, then he'd send it over to me, and I had to write out the parts for the violins and the parts for the for each part of the orchestra. I had to do that by, you know, on manuscript paper. We did it in uh, India ink, which is um, can be easily seen, of course, by members of the orchestra. Then we had an electric eraser would uh, take out any India ink that we'd written, so we correct it. But we didn't do that very often, otherwise the, the copy would not be very neat. Anyway, so there you go. Okay, now... Your Bach prelude, of course, is in 16th notes. You need to take all the notes here and reduce it or paraphrase it into whole notes. Okay, so your first measure then in reducing it to a, uh, a paraphrase in whole notes would be C. and E, and the treble is your G, C, and E. Now, these first four, uh, four measures are, are rather easy. They're rather basic, let's put it that way. But we need to start somewhere, because as we go through the composition, it will get very much more complex, and I don't know of anybody that's done it and to show exactly what Bach has done. Now, in analyzing Bach and knowing exactly how to put this whole thing together in a paraphrased form, then we can go on to Chopin and do exactly the same things with the same procedures as we've done with the Bach. In other words, we use the Bach as a starting point, as a learning uh, point. So we know how to write music, so we know how to write our characteristic intervals, and so on. And these are all going to be part of these videos. Okay, first of all, we need to write out the, uh, the what it is. Well, we need to rearrange these notes so it's line, 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 or space, 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 so we can under, understand what the root is. So we have line, line, line. Or up, bring these two up here. Line, 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 B, C, E, G. That's obviously... A chord built upon the first note of the C major scale and the piece is in the key of C major which we can call the key of the dumb of the uh, the key of the uh, tonic okay now first of all we have the root as being the lowermost note then we have the major third then this is the fifth you know it's one three five then the root then the major third is the uppermost note and the characteristic interval of this chord is the major third, which then makes it into a major triad. Okay, let's go on the second measure. Well, have your ruler so you can do this neatly. And this is going to be done in, with other compositions also. You may not need to write it out in manuscript form, but we do it in manuscript form, so at least we know how to write music. Okay, the next uh, measure, we have the, uh, here we go, um, C, D, A, D, F, well, what is the, what is the basic chord? Reducing this down to a paraphrase of whole notes, so we have the root on the bottom, in is root, third, fifth, seventh. That's, a, that's the hierarchy of these notes. Well, when we have two notes together like this, C and the D, the upper note will probably and most likely be the root. And that's a pretty good general rule. Two notes together like that, 
the upper note's the root. Well, let's check it out. D, we've got an F, an A, so it'd be the root, the minor third, the fifth, and what's on the bottom is the minor seventh. Because if this is the root, that's a step below the root, which is the minor seventh. If this were C sharp, it'd be, of course, the major seventh, but here it's the minor seventh. So reducing this down into a paraphrased version, then we have C, I'm going to make this a longer uh, line there so we can get the D there. So C and D. Then on your right hand, then we get A, D, and F. Okay, we've indicated that the D is the root. And if D is the root, that's the second note of the C major scale. Therefore, this is a chord built upon that second note of the scale. Then this is the minor seventh, as I just mentioned. Then this D, F, A is the fifth. D is the root. And F is the minor third. Uppercase for major, lowercase for minor. What's its... Now, some people will say, what's its quality? Well, it's a minor chord. I don't particularly care for that term. Let me get this in up here for you. I don't care for that term quality. I'd rather use the word identity. Because we can identify different chords by their sound or their written. So we can identify this then as a minor chord, lowercase m. That's better. Okay, it's a minor chord. How do we know it's a minor chord? Well, number one, we have a minor third, but we also have a minor seventh. You can call this a minor seventh chord. But when we call it a minor seventh, then we get into a functional indication. Numbers are always functions. So if we leave that as a minor chord, then we have two different types of chords here. We have a triad, which is made up of three different notes. Then let's say we have a quadrad, <laughs> made up of four different notes. So this would be a minor quadrad rather than the minor seventh. If you call it a minor seventh, not a big deal. But I just want to emphasize the fact that we're not indicating a... How do you indicate a major triad? There's no symbol. How do you write, indicate a minor seventh with the seventh? But then the seventh becomes a function. And I'd like to leave these middle notes as strictly the identity of the chords with their identifiers. L capital M for major, lowercase m for minor. Okay, so that's analyzed. That's done. Okay, let's draw, draw our... bar line here. Ah, let's do it this way. Maybe a little bit better. Easier. Yeah. Okay. Now, the third measure. Let's take the original here. Down here. Okay, now we have B, D, then G, D, and F. Okay, now, we have line, line, line here. If we take the D up an octave, it changes from a space note to a line note, which is already there, so we don't need that D. If we take this B up an octave, we change it from a space note B to a line note B. Now we've got G, B, D, F. Okay. So we have the B and the D. And then the right hand we have G, D, and G. And if any mistakes are made here, you've got an eraser. <laughs> Don't do this in ink. Okay. 
Now, as I mentioned, we've got line, line, so if we take the D up an octave from a space note to a line note, it's already there, so we can discount that D. Now the B, if we take that up an octave, we've got the B here. We've got G, B, D. Ah, you see, I've made a mistake, haven't I? We don't have a G on top, we have an F on top. Ah, let's see if I can get that a little bit better. Uh, okay, that's a little bit better, good. Okay, so this is the third measure. We've got G, D, and F. And if we take the B here, which is a space note, go up an octave, it becomes a line note. If we go down an octave, then this D becomes another line note. So that's a nice little principle to remember. Any note taken up or down an octave changes either from a line note to a space note or a space note to a line note. Okay, so G will be the root. And G is the fifth note of the C major scale. Therefore, there's going to be a chord built upon that fifth note of the scale. These are functions here. Function is simply position. Okay, so there's your root. One, three, five. One, three, five. This is the minor seventh on top. Notes are indicated with Arabic numerals. Chord functions, positions, are indicated with Roman numerals. And you never, never please use this. That's become a fad among some theorists. They just love to use that so that they can see, you can see that they know that this is a minor, the two is minor. <laughs> it, it's combining function and identity. Not a good practice. Not a good practice at all. Keep your note, keep your indications down here as strictly Roman numerals and that's it. This, up here is your chord identity. Uh, it, this is identified as a major uh, triad because of the major third. This is identified as a minor and we'll say quadrant because there's four, four different notes. So a major triad, a major, uh, a minor quadrant. And now this chord here, we got the root, all right, that's the based upon the fifth note of the scale. We've got that. Now G, G down here, G, taking this line note here, the root, down an octave, comes here, so G, B, that would be the major third as the lowermost note of this chord. We can call it quadrad. Let's get that a little bit more. See, easier seen. Okay, that's better. And G, B, D is the fifth. Now, this is... This this chord right here confounds all theorists because they don't know what it is. They don't have an identifier. An identifier. Small m is an identifier for minors. The uppercase m is an identifier for the major. Now, what do you have for an identifier? There is none in music theory. And five seven isn't an identifier because now look we've got the basic identifiers then we've also all of a sudden we run into a function but we've already got the function so that doesn't work while I was doing my master's degree in New York at the Manhattan School of Music I also studied with John Mahegan who was the jazz professor at Juilliard School in the, uh, at that time. He's passed away a long time ago. <clears throat> and But I studied with him, and I didn't study at Juilliard with him, but I studied at his studio in New York. And I obtained one of his first books on jazz improvisation, in which he used X's. And I thought, what on earth is he doing here? All these X's all over the place. And pretty soon I began to recognize X's are when he was indicating a dominant. 
So X then becomes the identifier for the dominant. X is an excellent identifier because it conflicts with nothing else in music theory or in analyzing musical composition. So that is the identifier for the dominant quadrad. <laughs> And its characteristic intervals are the major third and the minor seventh. Now, the major third and the minor seventh, in this particular situation, if we take the, the lower note here, and let's take the major scale of the, ma of the lower note, B, C sharp, D sharp, E, F sharp. So B to F sharp would be the normal fifth, but that's F natural, so that becomes a diminished fifth which is then a tritone. Tritone simply means three whole steps to get from the below note to the upper note. B to C sharp is one step, C sharp to D sharp is another step, and D sharp to F is another step. So that's one, two, three whole steps, which we call a tritone. Tritone. Okay, so we got that much done. Let's go ahead and put in a uh, bar line here. Okay, and then our last measure, the fourth measure here is the same as the first. Write it out, even though it's duplicated, just simply write it out again. And then the G and the C and the E. Go ahead and label them. Root, major third. This is getting practice of what you already know is excellent because it reinforces all of these different principles that we're working with. This is the fifth. That's the root. And this is the uppermost note is the major third. And it's the major third which is the characteristic interval of the triad which is major. And to finish this off, then we put in the bar line. It's also maybe a good idea to cross this out because we're not going to be using this as another measure. So we'll just X it out. Uh, X, you know, sometimes in books you'll see a blank page. And in, in the uh, middle of that blank page, it would say, left out on purpose. Well, okay, this indicates the measure left out on purpose. Because then we'll go to the next four bars. Music is generally written in four-bar phrases. That doesn't completely fit with this prelude, but four bars gives us just enough uh, music to do our, our, um, the work with. So... This is your analysis of the first four bars of the Bach. This in itself on paper here is useless. Unless you put it to use. <laughs> Talk about something that's obvious, huh? When you play this, you play this chord and then analyze it as you go along. Well, let's see how that works. Of course, I've got this as a video. But just to illustrate, all right, the root, the major third, the fifth, and the duplicate root in the major third. The lowermost note is, is the root, the upper note is the major third. That's sort of obvious, but do it because then the next one. What is this? Well, the two notes together, that's the root. So D, F, A, and C, if you bring it up an octave. Okay? See it for what it is. Most of the time, people simply memorize the notes. Not good enough. M memorizing something without understanding is what we call parroting. There's a, like a parrot. You say it enough times, say a phrase enough times. Hello, Jolly, or hello, Polly. <laughs> hello, Polly, hello, Polly. Or say it your name. Hello, Bob, hello, Bob. It'll say, it'll say it. But without any understanding at all. So when you memorize notes without any understanding, you're parroting. But if you go through and analyze the way that we have done it here, then it's automatically memorized. 
Oh, isn't that a novel idea? When you analyze something and go through it and analyze what the characteristic intervals are, what the all of the intervals by Arabic numerals, Roman numerals, and this is, by the way, your tonic again, you've understood what is in that music. Therefore, it's automatically memorized. You don't have to sit there by the hour memorizing things. You have to sit there and, <laughs> first of all, do this. You won't do this on every single composition that you learn, but doing it on the Bach, because we've we're using the Bach as our training uh, composition to understand the language of music, because Bach said it all. Okay, I think that's enough for this particular uh, video, and we'll go on to the playing of this uh, in our next video, and I have a little bit more information there. Talk to you later.